The smell of the old Hessian bag that covered your head reeked of stale alcohol and smoke. Not much of a stretch, since you did enter unannounced into a gambler's den. Your approach to things contradicted the work you did. However, ideally, this wasn't your primary line of work. As long as you were able to get something done, that was what was most important to you. The sudden pull of the bag over your head flooded bright light into your eyes, squinting at the sight of three large men in front of you. One of them you recognized as the owner of the den, his posture already a sign of dominance compared to the other two who stood just shy behind him. He towered over your restrained form, seated on a rickety-looking chair, your arms bound to the back of it. Do you know why you're here? He spoke intimidatingly. Ah, uh, I destroyed your front door? You answered innocently. Yes, that, but you also destroyed my reputation. He continued, his voice strangely softening. Do you know what that does to a man. You shrugged your shoulders, noticing one of his men inspecting your large mechanized mallet. Curious of its design. He was just as curious of his curiosity, finding that he tried to pull on a few levers and push a few buttons without any results. A smirk pulled on your lips, almost hoping he would push the right button. Hey! A strong slap to your face broke your stare and your thoughts. Turning back to the owner again, his lips now turned into a sadistic smirk. That's better. He commented. Now you're paying attention. Lies. You were paying attention. He was just boring. The entertainment laid in one of his men with your weapon in hand, still cranking and winding with nothing to show for it. You tasted the metallic sensation of blood in your mouth, sucking at your lip. The slap was quite hard that your teeth tore into your skin. Who sent you? Asked the owner, throwing the Hessian bag away and staring down at you. <sighs> what makes you think I was asked? You answered, still sucking on your lip. Can't someone just waltz right in with a bang? Not while holding that thing. His finger pointed towards your mallet, still being fiddled around by both of the men now trying to understand it. You smiled up at the owner, pulling a snarky look on your face, while inwardly laughing at how imbecilic the other men looked. You've been a piece of gossip around these parts. Someone like you bashing and crashing and taking away debts owed. You're working with someone. Who is it? <sighs> you hummed in reply, swinging your body on the chair with a creak every so often. Feigning ignorance had worked for you thus far, whether that would enrage people, or actually playing the dumb card. You just couldn't tell in this scenario. You know, this isn't the first time I've been hogtied. You admitted, waving your hands as high as they could from their restraints. I get it. You want to know more, but the only way you could is if you either interrogated me, tortured me, or both. And all those options are not ideal. The man's brow quirked, both in frustration and curiosity, while he folded his arms. So, I offer you this, you started, while you crossed your feet beneath you. I'll tell you who sent me if you press that button there. The owner turned to his men playing around with your mallet. 
The insurmountable number of buttons and switches that was present on the weapon astounded him. His men alone turned to you, wondering which button you requested. You smiled innocently at all three, your open eyes showing no malice. Just a button, repeated the owner, earning a small nod and an affirmed hum from you. Mm-hmm. Which one? That one. You said, pointing at your mallet. Which one? That one. Can you tell us which color? Asked one of his men from behind. Well, that would mean I have to give you the Pantone color, and do you know the hex colors at the top of your head? You asked, your eyes staring straight at his, and only being met with silence. I thought so. A frustrated growl escaped the owner's throat before he grabbed the mallet from his men and thrust it in front of you, laying your precious piece of equipment flat for you to see. Oh, which one? You smiled, coyly, before you brought one of your hands from your restraints and pointed as closely as possible to a large button on its side. That one. You answered, calmly. The owner stood up, mallet in hand, and his thumb laying atop the button before he turned to you, skeptical. Your smile still laid on your face, anticipating for some fun to start. It was growing too dull for your taste. With the push of the button, the sound of an engine roared from the head of the mallet, suddenly spewing out hot flame from a jet turbine. Thrust from the jet pushed the owner violently into his men, slamming all of them into the wall behind them with a sickening thud. Your smile widened into a grin when you clicked your heels, slipping out a blade from your boot and bringing it up to your hands, freeing yourself from your restraints. While the men hugged and grunted against the force of the mallet's turbine, you stood from the rickety chair, throwing away the blade carelessly. <laughs> you little- Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, no cussing under my roof, you taunted, until the sound of the overdrive began to dwindle, gradually. A momentary pause stilled your thoughts while you watched the turbines stop and start, allowing the men to free themselves from the pressure and from the brick wall. A wry grin tugged at the corner of your lips while the owner inspected the mallet, turning it towards you, his thumb back on the same button he pressed earlier. He growled under his breath, eyeing the weapon in his hand before he tossed it to one of his goons beside him. Get rid of them! He ordered. His men rushed towards you, wildly yelling with your mallet in hand. You watched their hands upon the handle and grip, smirking upon spotting their thumb pressing the same button again. The turbines started up, but not to the same effect as before. Instead, the opposite face of the mallet bursted open, causing the turbine to throw the man's arms into the air and fling him backwards. The force and inertia of the engine threw him in a loop, releasing his grip from the handle and freeing your mallet mid-air. There it was. There was the opportunity. With a hop onto the back of the other goon, you springboarded into the air, grabbing your mallet and swinging it towards the ground at full force. The thunderous smash of the mallet sent the men flying away from your epicenter causing them to crash into walls, shelves, and all manner of things that were cluttered in this dingy basement. Still in mid-air, you rolled atop the head of your mallet, finding your feet planted on the ground while you scanned your surroundings, seeing the destruction in your wake. Ah, thanks boys, you cooed, 
swinging the mallet casually onto your shoulders. Now, with a cheeky grin, you turn to the owner who sat by the floor, pushing himself away from you in fear before he felt his back flush against the wall, sitting beside one of his men knocked out. He trembled, watching you waltz casually towards him, your arms hanging loosely on the long handle of your mallet. With the push of a button, the whirring of the turbines began, while the heat lit up its head with a menacing fluorescent blue that cascaded across your body. Now, on to business, you started. You're right, I'm here to collect, but I think you made it harder than it should have been. So, I'm going to give you a choice. Pay up with commission or lose a hand. Which will it be? The owner cowered while you stood with turbines growing louder and brighter. However, you noticed his eyes drifting somewhere behind you, piquing your interest. The sound of the turbines did make listening for any sneak attacks difficult. But you took a glance behind you momentarily, spotting one of his goons rushing towards you. You quickly pivoted the mallet from your shoulders, holding your ground with the turbines growing in intensity. Hey, batter, batter, batter! You called before you swung your mallet into the man, the force of the turbines crushing into his ribs and sending him flying across the large basement. That didn't stop your follow through while you directed your mallet's compulsion towards the owner its head smashing into the brick wall, shy of the owner's head by a few hairs. Crushed debris crumbled onto his head, now disheveled and mussed from all the destruction you caused. You could see his body tremble and shiver, unable to look away from you, and the burning heat from the head of your mallet still smouldering. Hmm... I guess it's your hand. You decided before you violently pulled the mallet from the wall, raising it above your head. Uh, wait! cried the owner, halting you in your tracks. You watched him pull out a phone, pressing his thumb into the screen and dialing a few numbers. G uh, how much with the... Commission? Ten percent. You can count right. You interrupted, slamming the head of the mallet onto the ground before leaning on its grip. You watched with glee while the poor soul quickly dialed a bunch of numbers on the phone before revealing to you the exorbitant amount he owed, along with a bit of incentive on top. Your cheeky grin widened when you swiped the phone from him, punching in a set of numbers yourself and then turning the screen back. Now, pass go and collect. Please. You chirped, waiting for a fingerprint confirmation to complete the transaction. Without a thought, the owner did just that, allowing the wire of transfers to a bank account unfamiliar to him. Upon completion, you smiled tossing the phone behind you before digging into the pockets of his unconscious goon. Your face brightened when you felt the familiar sensation of your phone, now back in your hand, only to notice the barrage of messages that came through. A pout pulled on your face while you eyed the owner next to you, his eyes still fearful. <sighs> well, you're in luck. You stated, standing to your feet and picking up your mallet with ease. You get to keep your legs. Um, weren't you going for my hand? He asked reluctantly. No, oh, that was just me playing. You teased. I mean, I would have, but then that's no fun. Besides, you've got worse things to worry over. Like violating martial law? You reveled in the look in his eye, one filled with unspoken dread. 
Despite you no longer having your fun with him, your messages from Ida were clear. Collect the dead and get out. Your eyes skimmed over the string of messages, capturing the keywords you needed to get yourself out. Violations. Martial law. One. Katsuki. Bakugo. After all, you were dreading through dangerous territory. His. Well, good luck getting out of this one. You chirped while you slipped your phone in your pocket, skipping away towards the exit. I'm sure Mr. Bakugo can be an understanding guy. But that's wishful thinking. You hummed happily, leaving the man behind in the now partially destroyed basement and emerged onto the ground floor, its rooms torn apart and destroyed. Splintered tables, broken walls, some torn tapestries here and there. It was a pretty decent looking place, but you already tore through most of it when searching for the owner to pay up. Casually picking up a can, you opened it for a sip or two. Debt collection was a tiring job sometimes, and anything for free was a godsend. The sound of marching footsteps caught your ear along with the familiar explosive reverberation of Bakugo landing in front of the gambler's den with a scowl on his face. You exited from the destroyed entrance door, stepping over shattered glass and debris while waving happily at the irate blonde. You continue to walk past his army of drones, as you would call them, only for Bakugo to grab your waving wrist violently, stopping you in your tracks. It took you by surprise, more so shock, that he would treat someone as volatile as he did. Turning up to his red scowl on his face, he scoffed indignantly. You better be worth all this trouble, he warned. I have more important things to do. I'm sure Tenya will be thrilled you came to help. You genuinely said, speaking your truth. But I had everything under control. He just loves me too much. A disgusted growl escaped Bakugo's throat before he released his grip on you. Ugh. Next time I won't be so forthcoming, he threatened. Pass that along to four eyes. With that, he left you in the street, ordering his small militia with a nod of his head, raiding the now destroyed den. You perked with a smile and skipped away, listening to the sounds of explosions behind you like the beat of a drum to the music in your head. As per instructions, you were to immediately return to the agency. You scraped your boots to clean them along the welcome mats of the reception hall, despite the fact that you were covered in filth already. It was quiet during this time of the morning, before the number of sidekicks would enter into the halls for another day in Musatafu. You stretched your arms while still holding onto your now dirtied mallet, making your way to an elevator to head down into your safe space. Well, your own research and development workshop. Debt collection was a side hustle, as most people would see it, if they only knew. Years after UA had brought about a change that was both unexpected and yet intriguing all the same, your scientific mind couldn't ignore it. You had to be a part of the action in some way or form, and it turned out this way. Moonlighting, doing the dirty work, for friends of Ida, that required a little push. The elevator doors opened to a long corridor 
while you walked through, eyeing the number of inventions and work in progresses that littered the rooms. You smiled at each one, recalling your progress, your process, and even some names you've given them from time to time. Languidly waltzing into your workshop, you swung your mallet onto the workbench, quickly inspecting its state before you smiled down at the contraption. Oh, sorry to put you through all that, Big Blue, you apologized. I'll make you better than ever. Not before you explain your soul, treasure, spoke a deep voice from behind, causing you to jump in surprise before you laughed at the sight. Tenya Ida sat by one of your benches, his stern look unimpressed. If it wasn't for the fact that agency hours would be opening soon, it looked as if he had stayed at the agency overnight in a disheveled dress shirt. I got the debt, you started with a wry smile. And a lot more, except now I wonder how much he paid Bakugo to come out of his little fortress. While you explained, Ida stood from the workbench and slowly walked towards you, his height and size intimidatingly overshadowing you from above. Your eyes followed his, looking up at him while you backed into the workbench that laid Big Blue, laughing nervously. <laughs> I had everything under control? We have processes for a reason, he explained, not with anger but with disappointment. If you had only listened, you would have completed more on that list of Saros. Yeah, well, I wanted to bring in the huge debt so that I could keep him happy for longer. You reasoned. Doesn't that sound better? Keep the client happy? Oh, I can't be reminding you every time when you go on a job to do your job, reprimanded Ida. Heading the agency is enough work as is. Your shoulders slumped, one due to your exhaustion and the adrenaline waning from your system, and two from Ida's constant need to be on your back. Tenya Ida had always been a stick in the mud, and for the short time you began to learn more about him, you saw how passionate he was to becoming a hero. It was inspiring, despite his rigid demeanor, but after graduation and growing in ranks in his family's business, you saw his views skew a little. He began to converse with friends who were growing astray, but also grew desensitized to the state of hero society that his family built their entire reputation on. It was a challenging time, one that you stood by his side through it all up until this day. Ida just grew tired of the cold and dispassionate approach of hero life, finding that his friends had found ways around the law more effective than the rigid life that he had learnt for so long. Although he felt trapped, leading a hero agency, his conversations with Todoroki had helped him in juggling this double-edged sword, using one face for the general public and another behind closed doors. And he was getting better at it. Not much was said about you. You had helped his brother to cope with his paralysis, using any mechanical prowess to help him walk again. However, it was years to go until something was perfected, and with you being one of the chief engineers in Ida's agency, you had more work on your plate. Here, and moonlighting for financial gain. Tiring work, one that you coped by finding the fun in it all, which was not to Ida's liking. You sighed and pouted at Ida's reprimanding until you felt both his arms beside you, leaning against the workbench and trapping you between it and him. His stare, cold yet fueled with a dark rage, bore into your eyes, resulting in a nervous chuckle from you. 
<laughs> you didn't pay Bakugo that much, did you? You asked reluctantly. For your sake, I hope you asked for more than the commission price. He warned, his glasses gleaming from the fluoro lights that lit the workshop. What if I didn't? His stare still held on to you, while his body drew closer, pushing you against the workbench. You closed your eyes, anticipating anything that Ida may be capable of doing until you felt his arm reach out from behind you, grabbing your mallet from the bench. He brought the broken weapon to him, his body towering over you while he inspected the damage that was laid waste to it. Big Blue will be suspended for a while, he answered with what you thought was a tiny smirk from him. What? you exclaimed. But I need her, she's my baby! Not until you collect the other debts without her, continued Ida. You've already caused enough of a racket. I'm interested to learn how you would do without this. Now he was just teasing. He did mean it, but he was enjoying your reaction to your codependency with your pet project. He swung the mallet over his shoulder and began to walk towards the door, his smirk turning into a smug smile, until he felt you tug at the back of his shirt, attempting to pull him back. Please give her back! You pleaded. I'll be good! I'll do what you say! Anything, questioned Ida, turning around to face you. You soon realized the words you were about to say. After years of doing this kind of work, you've grown accustomed to Ida's dealing methods, having to listen very carefully to his words, but also be mindful of yours. You chuckled again with your hands raised in front of you. <laughs> well, I don't mean anything, you reiterated. Backtracking. She's my comfort item. I... I can't work when she's not with me. Ida's smug look, for a moment, turned warm, raising his large hand to ruffle your already must hair. You flinched a little from the roughness he held on your head, but finding that little comfort from him before he engulfed you in his arms, pulling you into him. Am I not comfortable enough? He asked, feeling your face nuzzle into his chest. You melted into his warmth. You knew he teased you this way, but to your dismay and your glee, you let it go and allowed yourself to be absorbed by him. Collect the rest and Big Blue will be returned good as new. He bargained before releasing you from his embrace heading for the door. Impress me, that's what I'd like to see. He watched his tall frame pass the threshold, turning to face you, now with a smile. Whatever feeling you could capture from Ida, you always kept it close to your heart, and in your memory, for as long as you could. After all, the close calls and favors Ida has asked to follow up on your job if not just for that, was an act of love and concern. It couldn't be anything otherwise. Is that your way of saying I love you? You asked, your smile still present with dreamy eyes, looking back at Ida. You spotted that warm smile again on his face, your heart a flutter. Despite these shady dealings, he was still a good soul, doing his best between fences. You were in the same boat, two kindred souls carefully traversing the unpredictable landscape between heroes and now established villainy. We shall see, won't we, treasure?